<clears throat> okay, so welcome to the uh, third class in this series of uh, discussions about uh, the book Approaching the Buddhist Path by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Venerable Tupton Chudrin. Um, tonight we will be focusing on the Four Noble Truths. And um, it's kind of a general introduction to the Four Noble Truths. Um, and I, I actually found the uh, sutra, the sutra of the Wheel of Dharma, which is the um, sutra with the teaching on the Four Noble Truths. So I thought that we would go ahead and start by reading it because it's um, really beautiful, really powerful. And, um, you know, what better way to set our motivation and uh, deepen our understanding about the, <laughs> the Four Noble Truths and to read the actual sutra. So I'm going to try to do a screen share. So let's see if I can do this. Do, 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 do. Share. And maybe this is it. Yes, this is the first one. Okay. So we can all um you know read this together. <clears throat> Homage to the omniscient one. Thus did I hear at one time the Blessed One, the Buddha, was residing in the Deer Park at Risvandana by Varanasi. At that time, the Blessed One spoke to the group of five monks. Monks, regarding things that I had not previously heard, as I reflected thoroughly, the vision arose, and the insight, knowledge, understanding, and realization arose. This is suffering, the truth of noble beings. Monks, regarding things that I had not previously heard, as I reflected thoroughly, the vision arose, and the insight, knowledge, understanding, and realization arose. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. And this is the path leading to the cessation of suffering. Monks, regarding things that I had not previously heard, as I reflected thoroughly, the vision arose, and the insight, knowledge, understanding, and realization arose. With higher knowledge, I should comprehend suffering, that truth of noble beings. Monks, regarding things that I had not previously heard, as I reflected thoroughly, the vision arose, and the insight, knowledge, understanding, and realization arose. With higher knowledge, I should relinquish the origin of suffering, that truth of noble beings. Monks, <clears throat> regarding things that I had not previously heard. As I reflected thoroughly, the vision arose, and the insight, knowledge, understanding, and realization arose. With higher knowledge, I should relinquish the origin of suffering, that truth of noble beings. Monks, regarding things that I had not previously heard, as I reflected thoroughly, the vision arose, and the insight, knowledge, understanding, and realization arose. With higher knowledge, I should actualize the cessation of suffering, that truth of noble beings. Oops. Monks, regarding things that I had not previously heard, as I reflected thoroughly, the vision arose, and the insight, knowledge, understanding, and realization arose. With higher knowledge, I should cultivate the path leading to the cessation of suffering, that truth of noble beings. Monks, regarding things that I had not previously heard, as I reflected thoroughly, the vision arose, and the insight, knowledge, understanding, and realization arose. With higher knowledge, I have comp comprehended suffering, that truth of noble beings. Monks, regarding things that I had not previously heard, as I reflected thoroughly, the vision arose, and the insight, knowledge, understanding, and realization arose. With higher knowledge, I have relinquished the origin of suffering, that truth of noble beings. Monks, regarding things that I had not previously heard, as I reflected thoroughly, the vision arose, and the insight, knowledge, understanding, and realization arose. With higher knowledge, I have actualized the cessation of suffering, that truth of noble beings. Monks, regarding things that I had not previously heard, as I reflected thoroughly, the vision arose, and the insight, knowledge, understanding, and realization arose. With higher knowledge, I have cultivated the path leading to the cessation of suffering, that truth of noble beings. 
monks, until I had achieved the vision, insight, knowledge, understanding, and realization of these four truths of noble beings that are turned in three phases and comprise 12 aspects. I had not been freed from this world with its devas, from its living beings, including maras and brahmas, as well as mendicants and brahmins, from its gods and humans. I had not escaped from it, severed ties with it, or been delivered from it. Nor did I dwell extensively with a mind free from error. Monks, I did not have the knowledge that I had fully awakened to unsurpassed and perfect Buddhahood. Monks, once I had achieved the vision, insight, knowledge, understanding, and realization of turning these four truths of noble beings in three phases with 12 aspects, I was freed from this world with its devas, from its living beings, including maras and brahmas, as well as mendicants and brahmins, from its gods and humans. I had escaped from it, severed ties with it, and been delivered from it. I dwelled extensively with a mind free from error. Monks, I then had the knowledge that I had fully awakened to unsurpassed and perfect Buddhahood. When the Blessed One had given this Dharma dis discourse, Venerable Kandinya, <clears throat> along with 80,000 gods, achieved the Dharma vision that is free from dust and stainless with regard to phenomena. The Blessed One now asked Venerable Kandinya, Kandinya, did you understand the Dharma? Blessed One, he replied, I understood. Kandinya, did you understand? Did you understand? Well gone, one, he replied, I understood, I understood. Because Venerable Kandinya has understood the Dharma, Venerable Kandinya shall now be known as Aditanya Kandinya. At that point, the terrestrial yakshas called out, Venerable Kandinya has understood the Dharma. And they continued, friends in the deer park at Sri Vandana by Varanasi, the Blessed One has turned the wheel of Dharma in three phases with 12 aspects. He has turned the wheel of Dharma in a way that no mendicant or Brahmin and no god, Mara or Brahma in the world could ever do in accord with the Dharma. He has done so for the benefit of many beings, for the happiness of many beings, out of love for the world and for the welfare, benefit and happiness of gods and humans. Hence, the gods will flourish and the demigods will be on the wane. As the voices of the terrestrial yakshas rang out, at that very moment, in that very instant, and at that very time, the news passed to the celestial yakshas, as well as to the gods in the heaven of the four great kings, the heaven of the 33, the heaven free from strife, the heaven of joy, the heaven of delighting in emanations, the heaven of making use of others' emanations, and all the way to the Brahma realm. Thus also the gods in the Brahma realm announced, Friends, in the deer park at Rishvadana by Varanasi, the Blessed One has turned the wheel of Dharma in three phases with 12, 12 aspects. He has turned the wheel of Dharma in a way that no mendicant or Brahmin, no god, Mara, or Brahma in the world could ever do in accord with the Dharma. He has done so for the benefit of many beings, for the happiness of many beings, out of love for the world and for the welfare, benefit, and happiness of gods and humans. Hence, the gods will flourish and the demigods will be on the wane. In the deer park at Ushvadanam by Varanasi, the Blessed One turned the wheel of Dharma in three phases of 12 aspects. Therefore, this Dharma teaching was named Turning the Wheel of Dharma. This completes the Sutra of the Wheel of Dharma. It was so beautiful. <laughs> it was just so cool. <clears throat> Going back to um, approaching the Buddhist path, <clears throat> when we think about um, the state of uh, samsara, we talk of thinking about you know the feelings, the feelings of, of craving and, and attachment. Um, how that's this is associated with like an innate, innate wish for happiness. An innate wish for stability and for peace and freedom from suffering, right? And this, um, these feelings, these strong feelings of craving and attachment, um, give rise to uh, actions, right? We behave in a way in accordance with that strong desire, um, and so we engage in many activities, you know, both virtuous and non-virtuous, um, and the results. Um, 
of these actions that's driven by the motivation of desire and attachment primarily. Um, until now, everything that we've done, our actions of body, speech, and mind have not created uh, a lasting sense of uh, stability or peace or joy, right? And uh, why not? Because we are in cyclic existence, right? We're in a state of samsara. <clears throat> and so what is samsara? As uh, we talked about in the previous class, um, it's a state of having a body and mind under the influence of karma and the mental afflictions. And so within cyclic existence, we encounter only, <clears throat> only suffering, right? Only unsatisfactory conditions, only uh, suffering. And so, you know, when we um, <clears throat> see the, um, not just uh, our own suffering, and not, not only the experience, you know, it's not just seeing it, but the experience of our own suffering, uh, our own pain, but as we look around and we see the suffering of all those, you know, around us, uh, from the very uh, extreme suffering of uh, living beings in war zones um, <clears throat> or, or extreme uh, illnesses or, um, you know, situations of, of abuse, etc. cetera. Um, you know, the way to, one way to think of that type of suffering, which we may not be experiencing right now, is that this is the suffering that uh, we will um, experience at some point, you know, in the future, right? This is the suffering that we have experienced in the past. And I mean, we may be experiencing it now, but we will be experiencing it in the future, right? And so when we talk about how um, immoral uh, actions that we um, engage in today, you know, how if we hurt others and we don't restrain ourselves, um, that we are creating all this negative karma. And so oftentimes we'll think about, oh, you know, this is going to result in a rebirth in the lower realms. But then that's, you know, not untrue, right? You know, but another way of thinking about it that's perhaps a little bit more approachable, more easy for us to understand, since the lower realms, you know, is not something that we can see directly, right? But we can think about the suffering of others um, around us and think that, okay, you know, if I'm not careful, if I don't make an effort to uh, res restrain my actions of body, um, speech, and mind, then, then, you know, I'm creating the causes and conditions to experience that kind of suffering uh, right now. And so to... Um, counteract, you know, our, our suffering, uh, present and future suffering, then, you know, we engage in uh, studying the Dharma, right, listening and studying and meditating the Dharma as a, the uh, ultimate means of freeing ourselves from sorrow, um, freeing ourselves from suffering. But, you know, it's um, <clears throat> very good to make that kind of an effort. Um, and yet uh, we must also put these teachings, you know, into practice, right? And so um, just reading and studying um, the Dharma is, is not enough. We need to actually um, use the Dharma to uh, change our habits, change the way we act, change the way we think, right? Change our motivation. So uh, going back to the Four Noble Truths then, <clears throat> um, it's uh, we can think of this sort of as uh, a, um, you know the, the Buddha's being the great uh, uh, physician, right? The great doctor, and so he helps us uh, diagnose the problem, right? What's the problem? Well, we're trapped in samsara, the state of suffering. What's the cause of the problem? Um, karma, and negative emotions uh, arising from ignorance, right? How do we eliminate the problem or eliminate our mental and physical suffering or illness? It's to uh, cultivate uh, renunciation, right? The three trainings, renunciation. The next one is bodhicitta 
and then right view. Uh, and all three of these are based in or grounded in pure ethical conduct. And then what's the result? Uh, if we uh, take the medicine as it's prescribed, what's the result? It's the uh, gradual recognition that the uh, depth of um, the illness, the chronic illness that we're experiencing, and certainly um, an understanding that, that cessation, that liberation is uh, achievable, and that the Buddha's medicine, the Buddha's methods are unmistaken. And so um, as we continue to uh, listen and reflect and, and put the teachings into practice, then we work on um, developing the confidence that uh, freedom from uh, suffering or, or in, in other words, that liberation is indeed, you know, possible. So um, Buddha, you know, taught the Four Noble Truths, you know, in that particular order, right? Starting with the diagnosis, um, detailed explanation about suffering, and then what's the cause, right? So just as I just explained it, you know, because once we understand and we recognize the, um, just how awful suffering uh, really is, how awful being stuck in samsara really is, um, once we understand that, then we're willing to consider, you know, the hard, um, the hardships involved in freeing ourselves from sar from samsara. <clears throat> On the other hand, um, you know, we might get depressed just by um, contemplating the sufferings of um, cyclic existence, right? Because there's, especially like you know, the presentation in the Lamrim is extremely uh, profound and detailed, and and you know, there's so many different ways of slicing and dicing suffering. And, um, you know, a lot of people, I think particularly Westerners, you know, we tend to give up. Like we we hear about the sufferings of cyclic existence. And then, um, you know, it just seems like really depressing. And uh, we kind of lose, you know, interest because on the other hand, um, enlightenment, you know, just seems to be so abstract and uh, so difficult to attain with a lot, you know, without doing a lot of <clears throat> hard work, a lot of sacrifices, right? And so, and so we tend to just think that maybe, a, you know, a different path, a different spiritual path would be better suited, um, might, might be better for us, right? So, um, so I thought we would try just going through the presentation of the Four Noble Truths actually in reverse order. <laughs> so we're going to start with the path to cessation, right? So the four no fourth noble truth, we're going to talk about that first, along with the third noble truth, with, which is the description of the state of cessation, right? And then we'll work down to the second, which is the origin of suffering. And then the first, which is suffering. Um, and so the... Particularly, I think for us as beginners, then the description of the fourth and the third noble truth, you know, is um, um, not uh, as clearly, um, it's, it's much more difficult to understand, right? Because basically, the state of enlightenment is uh, inexpressible and inconceivable. Um, so, um, <clears throat> in the, the text says... Um, about the third truth, it says the final truth, excuse me, the final true cessation, the third truth is liberation and nirvana, the state of peace, joy, and fulfillment that we seek. Here, ignorance, afflictions, and polluted actions, and the unsatisfactory experiences they cause have been extinguished from the root, so they can no longer arise. True cessations are attained by depending on a method that eradicates ignorance. This is true paths. The fourth truth, which consists primarily of the wisdom realizing the ultimate nature, the emptiness of inherent existence of all persons and phenomena, and the virtuous consciousnesses supported by that wisdom. So those are the <clears throat> descriptions of uh, the third and the fourth truth uh, from, from approaching the Buddhist path. So... Um, let's take a little bit of a closer look at the uh, true cessations. So 
the idea is that uh, as we um, meditate um, on each of the uh, impurities that needs to be uh, uprooted, um, uh, eliminated, then um, as we come to that conclusion, so to speak, or to that realization, you know, point by point, then um, the the origins of suffering, which each of these would represent, right, would be gone for good. And so then we end up with a mind stream that uh, is completely pure and will no longer become soiled, will no longer become contaminated, right? So it's not like, um, to give a silly example, but it's not like, you know, when you wash your clothes and you put on some really good spot remover or something, um, that would eliminate the uh, stain from your t-shirt, you know, temporarily, but it doesn't prevent the t-shirt from getting, you know, dirty again, right? Um, and also it's, you know, important to um, clearly understand exactly what this, this state of uh, true cessation really is because um, otherwise, you know, we might be um, fooled, not fooled, but we might get uh, the wrong idea and think that some type of very pure uh, meditative, uh, state of meditative absorption, that that is um, a true cessation, that, that that is liberation when in fact it's not. <clears throat> Apparently, that is um, a subtlety that um, can can arise, <clears throat> a subtle you know pitfall or subtle trap that can arise. So, um, I thought I would just have um, take a minute to to read a few quotes from the uh, Uttara Tantra, uh, where the description of uh, the state of uh, nirvana or liberation enlightenment um, is uh, more clearly, you know, expressed. And um, this is from the book Buddha Nature. And I know, you know, I've read from this book before. I'm sure you have uh, as well. I can kind of tell where I read because I have these bookmarks. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, I've probably read from here. Um, but it's always good to read this over and over again, right? So just a couple of quotes. I won't go on for too long, but it's so beautifully stated. You know, there's no way that um, I can try to paraphrase this or anything. Um, Enlightenment, of which the Buddha said, it is by nature clear light, is similar to the sun in space. It is free from the stains of the adventitious poisons and hindrances to knowledge, the veils of which obscured it like a dense sea of clouds. Buddhahood is permanent, steadfast, and immutable, possessing all the unpolluted Buddha qualities. It is attained on the basis of two primordial wisdoms. One is free from ideation with regard to ph phenomena, and the other is discriminative. <clears throat> and then skipping a bit. Uh, purity from the adventitious afflictions of desire and the other mental poisons is like the water of the lake and so forth. When put concisely, it can be fully shown as the fruit of wisdom free from ideation. The actual attainment of the Buddhakaya, which has all supreme aspects, is explained as a fruit of primordial wisdom ensuing from this after meditation. Having eliminated the salt of desire, he lets the waters of meditative stability flow onto the lotus-like disciples and thus resembles the lake of pure water. Having freed himself from the Rahu of hatred, he pervades beings with the light rays of his great love and compassionate concern, and thus is similar to the immaculate full moon. Totally freed from the clouds of unknowing and dispelling its darkness within beings, through the light rays of primordial wisdom, Buddhahood is similar to the unpolluted sun. <clears throat> So 
since enlightenment has peerless properties, since it bestows a taste of sacred dharma, and since it is free from the peel of the veils, it is like the sugata, the honey and the grain. Since it is purified, since being's poverty is dispelled by the wealth of its qualities, and since it grants the fruit of total liberation, it is like the gold, the treasure, and the tree. Representing the jewel of the Dharmakaya and the attainment of the Supreme Lord of Humans and manifesting in the likeness of a precious image, they are like the bejeweled, the king, and the golden. It's just so beautiful. I mean, I could keep keep reading, but um, hang on one second. I think there was one other really, really nice quote. Having offered bodies, lives, and goods, they purely uphold the sacred dharma. In order to benefit all sentient beings, they fulfill their vow as initially taken. Buddhahood supremely expresses itself as compassion, both cleansed and purified. Appearing on the feet of miraculous powers, they can act forever by means of these. By knowledge, they are freed from the belief fixed on the duality of samsara and nirvana. They always possess the best possible bliss of samadhi beyond ideation and end. While acting in the world for others' good, they are unsullied by all worldly phenomena. Free from dying, it is the attainment of peace. In this sphere, the demon of death cannot roam. The state of the Muni being of uncreated nature has been fully pacified since beginningless time. For all those who are bereft of permanent shelter, it provides the most delightful refuge, and so on. Okay, one last verse. <laughs> it is inconceivable since it cannot be verbally expressed. It is inexpressible since it consists of the absolute truth. It is absolute since it cannot be intellectually scrutinized. It is inscrutable since it cannot be inferentially deduced. It is not deducible since it is peerless. The highest of all it is the highest of all since it is not comprised by anything. It is uncomprised since it does not dwell on any extreme. This is because there is no dualistic idea of quality and fault. <clears throat> hmm. Okay. So that's a little, little, little tiny taste just to... Uh, Get you interested in um, continuing to study more on this topic, right? Um, so we're saying that um, that that nirvana is ultimate peace, right? It's a state of uh, liberation. It's ultimate peace. So you know what we could try to do, since it's uh, inconceivable, inexpressible, is is to try to in our meditation, though, you know, try to imagine what it would be like to be free of all. You know, negative emotions. Uh, to 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 rest in the state of equanimity, right? Of not picking and choosing, not discriminating bad and good, um, and and to be free from all of the strong passions, as it were. Right? <clears throat> Even to try to um, think of that kind of state of mind is 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 difficult, right? It's hard to to just get our minds to settle down and stay in one place and um, to, <clears throat> let alone, you know, imagining something as vast and profound as, as a state of enlightenment. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, we need to be a little bit careful because uh, if we um, start dreaming about attaining Buddhahood, you know, we start having, you know, a sense of, wow, that would be so fantastic to uh, attain, you know, nirvana. Um, then that can become, you know, another, in a way, another type of attachment, right? So, you know, it's an aspiration for sure. It's, a, it's something that motivates our practice, but we need to be able to, you know, check, 
right? Just to check to make sure that's a healthy aspiration and not one that is too overly mixed with like a selfish, selfish attachment. There's, I think, there's definitely a difference there that we have to bear in mind, right? Um, and then at the same time, you know, in terms of like in the last session, we were talking about rebirth. And uh, we talked about uh, be, making sure that we understand that what's reborn from uh, life to life is um, just <clears throat> this uh, extremely subtle, you know, mental consciousness that travels, uh, changes from moment to moment and travels from life to life, right? So if we're not careful, then we might think, you know, like kind of like in the popular sense that we talk about rebirth, reincarnation, um, that, you know, it's just like we switch, change our clothes or something. <laughs> we change our clothes and then we're reborn, but, you know, we're still the same uh, identifiable, uh, you know, person, right? So, so we need to make sure that our understanding is correct there too, right? And then, um, you know, the third point to watch out for is uh, related, I think, to sort of, also this idea of attachment, but um, the <clears throat> spiritual materialism, you know, the sense that, um, you know, all we need to do is wear a lot of red clothes or, you know, possibly even, you know, take take ordination um, and, and just kind of hope for miracles, but, um, you know, without being willing to roll up our sleeves and really do the hard work of um, taming our minds. <clears throat> um, so then all of that, you know, I guess are, those are just things to be aware of. You know, I'm not saying anything new, but just <laughs> a repetition of advice uh, that will help us, you know, as we pursue um, the true, true paths, right? The true paths being that which uh, carries us towards um, the true cessations, right? So, um, in volume three of the Library of Wisdom and Compassion, so we're reading volume one, right? So I skipped ahead and I took a peek at volume three and uh, definition of the true paths uh, as explained in volume three is, and I quote, is the wisdom realizing the 16 attributes of the four noble truths, especially true cessation. Existing in the mind stream of Aryas of all three vehicles, true paths eradicate ignorance and other afflictions. When afflictions cease, polluted karma is no longer created, and that which has already been created cannot ripen into a samsaric rebirth. Liberation is attained. Okay, and so <clears throat> for the Pali tradition, um, True path uh, encompasses or is is defined as the eightfold noble path, which is right view, right speech, right livelihood, right mindfulness, right concentration, right thought, right action, and right effort. Um, from the Prasangika Madhyamika perspective, um, cutting to the chase here, then <laughs> true path is the um, <clears throat> Arya's realization. Um, based on the wisdom directly realizing uh, the emptiness of inherent existence. Uh, I mean, and that being said, you know, it that realization goes hand in hand with the six perfections, right? And those six perfections um, are very similar to the uh, Eightfold Noble Path. So engaging in the methods uh, as well as the uh, development of wisdom. <clears throat> So in general, you know, we're talking about meditating on the 16 aspects of the uh, Four Noble Truths in order to eliminate all of the doubts that might arise, all of the questions, you know, that, that we um, um, come up with uh, about uh, the origins of suffering, right? About how to get out of suffering, all, you know, all of these different uh, questions that, that we've been entertaining. Um, <clears throat> so that's the purpose of uh, further investigating the uh, Four Noble Truths. 
Um, So I wanted to um, take a minute to just uh, do a little bit of a pep talk, <laughs> going back to what I mentioned earlier, that um, when we are thinking about uh, attaining, you know, true cessations, tr uh, attaining the state of, of Buddhahood by following the true paths, then very... Um, then we can easily become, you know, kind of discouraged. And uh, we might think, oh, you know, this is absolutely, you know, impossible. It's um, really hard to uh, uh, get rid of, you know, negative emotions, you know, such as anger and jealousy and pride and, and all the rest, right? Attachment. Even that, you know, on a day-to-day, -day, uh, ordinary, mundane level, that is not easy, right? <clears throat> because we've been acting, you know, uh, based on these habits, these negative habits of mind for since beginning this time, like over and over again, even just when you think of just this one lifetime, right? We're very well versed. We've rehearsed, you know, our responses. If you poke me, I'm going to poke you back, right? So, you know, let alone attaining um, something as lofty as Buddhahood. Um, and so, um, it's important not to, however, uh, fall into that uh, trap, right? It's important to keep going and um, to uh, examine and to um, um, embrace, you know, the teachings on um, enthusiasm, on joyous perseverance, Um which is, uh, you know, joyful effort. Sometimes it's also tra translated as uh, joyful effort. Um, that's one of the six perfections, right? And so, um, you know, <clears throat> uh, and it, based on our own experience from our own practice, then, you know, we can see, I think, that um, things do get easier. Uh, life becomes, you know, a little bit more, um, gentle and forgiving, perhaps, as our relationships with others improve, because we're not so cranky and crabby, <laughs> because we are, you know, refraining from harming others, because we are going the extra uh, mile to to help others, you know, and not not faking it, but from a, a sincere sense of caring for others, right? Then life gets easier. Uh, as we control our minds, as we control our emotions. And so, you know, we do slowly, slowly make progress. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, the Dalai Lama and Venerable Tupton children write, um, while nirvana may sound like a far off goal, we can easily see steps going in that direction. And the more we cease anger, the greater harmony we experience, and the more our greed diminishes, the greater contentment we have as we gradually reduce ignorance and afflictions through the application of wisdom, tranquility, and fulfillment correspondingly, correspondingly increase, culminating in nirvana. <clears throat> Venerable uh, Tendro. Uh -huh. Hi, Cynthia. Uh, do you mind if I ask a question? <clears throat> sure. Um, so you, in the book, it, so for the Four Noble Truths, it doesn't seem, I guess based on my understanding of it, just, it doesn't seem to emphasize the bodhicitta aspect although you mentioned it like that in order to achieve buddhahood that it's it includes uh wanting to attain attain it for the benefit of all sentient beings which is stress in mahayana um and in the book it does mention that the the Four Noble Truths seems to have taught how to attain nirvana rather than Buddhahood. 
but in the text that you read, it mentioned Buddhahood. So I don't know if that's just translation. So I was wondering if, you know, is that because the Buddha taught or expanded on that later or in a diff in a later turning of the wheel? Oh, that's or is that just the emphasis? Yeah, I was... Yeah, that's a really good question because we just read the whole sutra. <laughs> <laughs> the whole sutra did not talk a whole lot about... Well, no, it, 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 there is some more... It, it did, it did. It talked about the welfare of sentient beings, right? Towards the end of it, it does. Why did you go back and look? It, but Well, but is it in the actual sutra? Because just, just the simple way the four noble truths were stated, which in some ways makes sense because it's understood by, you know, uh, it's it's explained simply, but it doesn't seem to stress. Yeah. I mean, it mentions the, the essential point of understanding the true nature. Uh -huh. But does true nature encompass the wanting to benefit all sentient beings? Should I understand it that way? Um. True nature. Like the Mahayana part of it. Um, so, am I making sense? Sorry. <laughs> um, 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 um. Well, hang on. I want to go back and look. Let me see. Let's see. Let's see. Hang on. All right. So verse 1.18 says, He has done so for the benefit of many beings, for the happiness of many beings, out of love for the world, and for the welfare, benefit, and happiness of gods and humans. Right? So, so that's his motivation, right? The Buddha's motivation for uh, teaching. Yeah? So that seems like that's that's pretty... Pretty clear that, statement. That's part of the sutra. Yeah, itself. that we just read. Yeah, yeah. But oh. not necessarily one of the four noble truths, correct? Or should I assume it's part of the? Yeah, yeah. The, the overall motivation. Eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. I think that's fair. Um, and maybe we'll see that more as we go through, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. I think as we talk about, um, the next one, which is the, I think we're getting down here to the, the first noble truth, the truth of suffering, right? Um, when we see that the suffering that we experience um, is based on our own innate, you know, self-grasping, um, and then the associated self-cherishing, -cherish right? Um, and then how that ignorance, um, causes us to, to harm others, um, and that we need to put an end to that, um, habit, Right in order to stop creating the negative har karma from harming others um, that causes us, you know, future suffering. And so I think implicitly the idea is there that um, we, if you think about it sort of from a selfish perspective, we need others, we depend on others in order to eradicate, right, to purify the negative karma that we created in relation to them. Um, and seeing their suffering um, is what um, drives us, you know, seeing their suffering and being able to relate to their suffering. Um, that compassion, right? Compassion being defined as um, not just witnessing suffering, but thinking that it's my personal responsibility to be able to eliminate that suffering. Um, that's what uh, gives us the, um, um, not just the confidence, well, the confidence and the courage and the determination to uh, do whatever we can to attain enlightenment in order to, um, to help them, help, help other 
uh, living beings. <clears throat> so, so my question was, you know, as we, we start to um, think about the first noble truth, you know, uh, in greater detail, we take a closer look at it. You know, on the one hand, it could seem just just very depressing, and we might want to just close the book and say, "Oh, <laughs> maybe I'll read this some other time." On the other hand, you know, sometimes when you read about the state of suffering and different kinds of suffering, it seems like you know it's really realistic and it accords with our own experience. And you kind of think, "Wow, you know, the, the Buddha is telling it like it is, right? This is really true." And and the fact that it rings true, you know. It, it confirms our suspicions, I think, that what society tells us, what our culture tells us, you know, should make us happy. We've kind of known all along that that's not true, right? You know, we're starting to see through the lies that um, materialism, um, a materialistic culture, uh, you know, tries to get us to believe, you know, is 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 true, right? <clears throat> and so, um, we, as we learn about the sufferings of sick of existence, and that really um, makes a, you know an impact on us. That, that really attracts our interest because we uh, can relate to the idea of you know the sufferings of uh, of, of conditioned existence, right? <clears throat> So that's why you know the the Buddha so skillfully presented the teachings on suffering um, at uh, initially, right? Because you know it, it draws us into the teachings, right? We say yes, yes, that's my experience. You know, I see that happening all around, and and it's so awful, it's so dreadful. You know, I I want to put an end to this suffering forever. You know, not just for me, but for everybody around me. Right? <clears throat> So I think that, you know, there is a profound kind of sense of like, aha, you know, this is this is really true, you know. So it's not it's not depressing in any sense of the way, right? I think if it's a relief to know that um, you know, having all having a lot of material possessions, having, you know, a, being famous or or getting a lot of praise, you know, et cetera. <clears throat> Finding out that that's not the source of true happiness is actually a relief, right? Because we know that that's not true, right? So um, renunciation then is, you know, I think as we mentioned, we talked about this earlier, in a way it's a form of self-compassion, right? And so it's uh, cutting the chains of all of the mental habit habits, those negative habits in particular that bind us to, to suffering. Um, and it's easy to think, you know, sure, I want to um, give up, you know, I want to put an end to um, what seems like, you know, suffering, like, uh, you know, the yelling, the tears, you know, the fears, <clears throat> All of that's, you know, obvious that, that we would want to put an end to that. Nobody's going to, you know, argue with that, right? Um, but um, we need to also realize that we have to give up. You know, we're talking about renunciation, right? <laughs> Giving up what seems like happiness, right? So the opposite. So we need to give up our attachment to, then to, to the other side of the you know, the eight worldly dharmas, this is the same, same topic, right? So it's to the, to the praise, the fame, the financial security, then the happiness, physical happiness, et cetera, right? We always want more of the good stuff and we want less of the bad stuff, but we need to realize that, you know, the, the actual problem, the source here is our uh, attachment, right? It's that attachment, that clinging, that grasping mind, um, not the objects themselves. So renunciation then is this this resolution um, to abandon you know these three poisons and all the related consequences that stem from acting out on these um, th these drivers, <clears throat> and we need to 
uh, free ourselves from um, our mental delusions uh, before we can uh, effectively, you know, reach out to help others. <clears throat> And so we're trying to, you know, change our habitual tendency um, to to hurt others, right? Um, and instead to um, react in a, in a <laughs> react sounds kind of funny, but <laughs> we need to instead respond in a way with a mind, you know, of loving kindness, with a mind of of compassion trying to uh, relate to others uh, out of true uh, humility and uh, a deep sense, deep seated um, desire to be of, of service to others. So I think all of those you know ideas stem from this idea of uh, understanding the suffering that's around us. So, um, the text, you know, describes very, very briefly three kinds of suffering, and I'll just go through these quickly because I know all of you um, have have studied this before, so it's a bit of a review. But um, so, just quoting from the book, the first is the dukkha of pain. This is a physical and mental suffering that all beings see as undesirable, and all world religions agree that destructive actions such as killing, stealing, and lying bring physical and mental pain. <clears throat> uh, the second type of dukkha is a dukkha of change, which refers to worldly happiness. So these are the, the pleasant sensations. Um, that's the second type of uh, the dukkha of change, right? <clears throat> so worldly, unha worldly happiness is unsatisfactory because the activities, people's, people and things that initially give us pleasure do not continue to do so. Although eating and being with friends, receiving praise and hearing good music may initially relieve pain or boredom and bring pleasure, if we continue to do them, they will eventually bring discomfort or fatigue. <clears throat> then the third type of dukkha, the pervasive dukkha of conditioning, is the fact that we have a body and mind that are not under our control. And without choice, we take a body that is born, falls ill, ages, and dies. Between birth and death, we encounter problems even though we try to avoid them, and we cannot obtain any everything we want even though we try hard to get it. Even when our desires are fulfilled, that happiness is not stable. We become disillusioned or separated from what we crave. <clears throat> so this you know, third type of dukkha, the pervasive dukkha of conditioning, then, is uh, the most uh, difficult to... Um, um, become aware of, and so it's the that the one that we need to uh, focus on, I think, the most, <clears throat> since it's less uh, less obvious. So then, um, each of these. Uh, Four Noble tr Truths has um, four aspects, right? So that gives a total of 16 aspects. So we're not going to be able to go through um, the four aspects of each of the Noble Truths, you know, in this particular um, class. But I wanted to correct something that I said in um, the last session where I was talking about um, the uh, <clears throat> four aspects of uh, suffering because I got the, the last one wrong. So let me just go through these again, since we were just talking about suffering, right? Um, first noble truth then. So the, the first three are um, believing impermanent things to be permanent. Um, and so uh, instead, we need to think that the physical and mental aggregates are impermanent. Uh, the second is believing unsatisfactory things to be satisfactory. And so the explanation for this is that the aggregates are unsatisfactory by nature because they are under the control of karma and afflictions. Believing the unattractive to be attractive 
<clears throat> the explanation is that the aggregates are empty because they lack a permanent, unitary, and independent self. And then the last one is actually believing what lacks a self to have a self. The aggregates are selfless because they lack a self-sufficient, substantially existent person. Um, or from a prosangika perspective, then that would be the, um, the lack of an um, inherently existing person. So that's corrected for the record. <laughs> I wanted to continue with this idea. This is my my pep talk. <laughs> um, so talking about joyous effort and uh, the impor importance of perseverance and never giving up, right? Because um, you know that description from the Uttara, Uttara Tantra of the state of Buddhahood is so magnificent, right? Who wouldn't want to attain the state of Buddhahood? <laughs> um, uh, but it's it takes effort, right? It takes renunciation. It takes effort. Um, and um, uprooting the afflictions and breaking the bad habits of mind um, is like, uh, you know, this afternoon I was trying to dig up some uh, invasive, you know, rose rose bushes. That's considered a invasive species, the, the multiflora roses, because they spread so quickly and they um, choke out other native plants. And uh, so I'm out there, you know, with my shovel and uh, I'm like, tap, 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 tap. But, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, girl, <laughs> that's not going to do it. You really have to, um, you know, stab the roots and, you know, get under there and dig really, really hard. You have to strike very, very hard. And you got to wear, you know, big, thick gloves. You got to don the arm and put on the, almost like armor <laughs> to get out there and not get, you know, torn to shred by those uh, thorns. So um, I think breaking bad habits of mind is, is similar to digging up these rose bushes. You really, really have to work hard at it. I think I got out in an hour. I got, maybe got out three, two or three of these things, and I have got dozens left. It, <clears throat> so anyway. So um, a, a couple of more quotes. This is from... Um, this first one is from Geshe Sopa, volume three of the Lamrim Chemo, the discussion of the um, six perfections. Very beautiful and uplifting um, um, encouragement. Uh, so he says, um, <laughs> and the preceding uh, passage talked about the countless eons and many, many, many lifetimes of effort that will be required to achieve Buddhahood. And he says, just hearing about this length of time makes us tired. When someone tells us we have to work this long in order to attain Buddhahood, we become discouraged. We would consider the request to practice so long to be completely unrealistic. We would never even try to attain enlightenment if that were necessary. But a bodhisattva wearing the mental armor of perseverance is not disheartened, even if it takes us long to accumulate the merit to help a single sentient being. A bodhisattva would think it was worth it to live in the worst hell twice, three times, or even a thousand times longer than this if he or she could attain enlightenment. If bodhisattvas would not give up knowing it would be so hard and take this so long and take this long, then of course they would never give up on a shorter, easier task. So whether or not it takes a bodhisattva this long to attain enlightenment is not the point. The vast length of time simply illustrates the necessary level of commitment. Asanga says in the Bodhisattva Levels that a bodhisattva with joyous perseverance is never discouraged when working to attain enlightenment for the benefit of other sentient beings. No hardship or austerity is difficult Everything becomes easy. This irreversible courage is a bodhisattva's special armor. But we are not this disciplined. We want to achieve something in a few days, months, or at most a couple of year, years. <clears throat> it's likely that when we hear about this type of perseverance, we think 
Who could possibly be so determined? Who could act with such diligence is completely beyond our mental scope. So we reject it. That's why the Buddha said that simply admiring or having faith in this kind of perseverance is wonderful. So just admiring <laughs> the kind of this kind of perseverance is, is pretty good already. It's actually a kind of perseverance to think maybe it is possible for something so amazing to be true. I wish I could do it, and someday I will do it. This thought creates great merit. Heartfelt admiration is the seed that will sprout into measureless, joyous perseverance. If merely wishing for perseverance is special, then there's no need to say much about how extraordinary it is to actually have this courage. And then he continues, Tsongkhapa comments that we too can develop this type of courage if we train the mind. All sentient beings have the potential to become perfectly enlightened Buddhas. We all have the capability to develop a Bodhisattva's courage to do anything to help other beings without hesitation. At present, our potential is latent. It's been covered over by negative attitudes such as ignorance, attachment, hatred, jealousy, and pride for a long time. It's as if we have been asleep. <laughs> we cannot do much when we're sleeping, but when we awake, we have the potential to do hundreds of things. The practice of permanent, oh, sorry, perseverance will wake up our potential, and accomplishing this may take one's entire life. And even if it doesn't take that long, if we resolve... I will do this until I die, then all our activities will be forceful and fruitful. Therefore, Tsongkhapa says we should train ourselves this way. I thought that was so, so beautifully written. Um, so just generating, you know, that aspiration to have this type of, you know, stainless um, perseverance, even that generates, you know, vast amounts of merit. <clears throat> and so I guess it's like, you know, wishing bodhicitta versus um, engaged bodhicitta. Then, then this is, you know, maybe an example, an example of that. Here we're just aspiring to even have the perseverance to um, enter and engage in the activities on the path. <clears throat> then uh, similarly, there's a, a, I have got a quote from um, <clears throat> uh, Art Engel's uh, book, on the Bodhisattva Bhumis, and he says, um, upon hearing about all the Bodhisattva precepts that are observed by Bodhisattvas who have attained the great stages, one does not become frightened, diffident, or timid about the fact that they are vast, unlimited, and inconceivable, or that they must be practiced for long periods of time, and they are extremely difficult to carry out. One reflects in this very manner, the ones who have trained themselves gradually in the bodhisattva trainings and who have developed restraint by possessing the physical and verbal discipline that is unlimited and inconceivable did so as human beings. I too am a human being, and by gradually training myself, I shall also without doubt attain success in that very same physical and verbal discipline." Bodhisattva also is one who becomes established in the moral discipline by examining his or her own faults and inner failings, not by examining the faults and inner failings of others. He or she does not develop animosity or hatred toward any sentient beings who are violent and engage in wrongful conduct. Relying upon a form of great compassion that is based upon entities he or she develops a bodhisattva's attitude of especially strong sympathy towards such beings and a desire to act on their behalf. 
I think that's a very important point, particularly these days. <clears throat> When there's so there are quite a few people out there, uh, well-known people who tend to be violent and engage in wrongful conduct, um, and so they should be an object of our uh, special compassion. Right. I hope that's helpful. You know, I like these. Um, I like the pep talk. <laughs> I think it's uh, it's helpful, you know, for for those of us who are just um, beginning on the on the path, right? To uh, to not give up and to um, you know, even as I said earlier, like you know, in mundane situations, um, you know, whatever happens, you know, we're going to be uh, keeping in mind, you know, these practices of joyful perseverance and. Uh, mental vigilance, you know, and mindfulness to to check up on our minds, and and uh, patience, right? Patience that um, on that patience, which enables us to handle, you know, any type of adversity, and to think of uh, difficult situations as uh, something to uh, relish, you know, as as truly as an opportunity for practicing. Um, practicing dharma um and so one of the questions that came up in um <clears throat> Ken Rinpoche's class last sunday uh he's giving a talk about well he's on chapter six of the guide to the bodhisattva's way of life and which is about patience <laughs> and somebody um asked the question uh she said well you know i try to be patient but then everybody beats me up you know i get bullied so what do i do in that case you know and Rinpoche said very clearly, well, you know, you are practicing patience. That's that's fantastic. Um, and the fact that you're being bullied, you know, again, you need to, instead of thinking that as a, uh, as a negative, right, as a problem, then think of that, you know, as an opportunity, again, for practicing patience. <laughs> and so um, um, that's uh, one of the most difficult, you know, virtuous practices is the practice of patience, because it's uh, it's not easy. Um, again, it's you know uh, the antidote to to, to anger, which is um, fueled by by attachment, so <clears throat> and ignorance, right? Uh, but um, you know, as as we associate with um, as we as we try to keep in good company, you know, with uh, people who are practicing dharma, uh, we can follow people uh, uh, who can be our um, role models. I guess as a way of thinking about it, and as we disassociate from you know uh, bad company, I guess um, because we're you know weak, because we're feeble, and we're starting out on the path, then, then we need to be careful as to who we hang out with, who we engage with. Um, but um, you know, as much as possible, putting these um, good habits, you know, these perfections, um, these, well, they start as, as good habits, and then eventually, as we continue, then eventually, you know, we ourselves will be able to turn them into perfections. Okay. So, um, does anybody have any any questions? I'm sorry, I'm rambling on. I'm sorry, but I I don't have the place to raise my hand. So, if somebody else has their hand up, um, or can I go ahead and ask a question? Of course, yeah. So this is a a quick one. I think um, a while ago you were reading from the one of the books and. It, mentioned that Buddhahood is permanent. Uh-huh. And I wondered if that meant permanent in the fact in the way that we often hear, meaning it's not produced. So it's just always there or it's permanent once you've achieved it, it's permanent. Yeah, I think um and where was it? I think it was in the in the beginning. Book, yeah. Yeah, it's um that that sense that it's not something that we create. Right, that it's uncreated, that it's always the Buddha nature. Right, we always have this. Buddha um, nature is there. Okay. Clarity. Yeah, 
Yeah. And that travels in the subtle mind that Buddha nature is in everything. So I understood, I, I was asking Geshe about this and I might've misunderstood him, but that if I understood it right, that, that Buddha nature is just there and it's, when it becomes in contact with Dharma or the teachers, it's sort of like awakened. Am I, did I understand that correctly? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, I think the idea is that it's uh, obscured, right? By the veils of ignorance and it's always there waiting to be discovered. So when the contaminants are removed, then, then it shines forth, you know, like the moon obscured by the clouds. Right. right. But, but even just coming in contact with the Dharma can, begin to do that obviously. for us right yeah. so it would yeah for us as individuals right as we as we um study the dharma because you hear about there's some story you know I, I it's a story that you hear about the fly that was like floating around oh. a <laughs> stupa, but it was floating on a pile of manure or something like that <laughs> um that, that it achieved something i don't remember what 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 it was that it actually achieved was it buddhahood or i don't know eventually right because it accumulated so much positive karma from the action of going around the, the circumambulating it right yeah but it had to have other causes and conditions to let that be possible i would think mm, yeah the suffering of being a fly isn't good enough <laughs> i don't know i don't know how many how much I don't know. Anyway, so I, I just wanted to make sure I understood that right when it said Buddhahood. Was like nature of mind. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. It, it is not something that's produced, but it's awakened. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. That's still not equivalent to inherent existence when you say, when it uses the word permanence, right? It's uncompounded right. phenomena, which right. is not the same as inherent existence. Just well, to be clear, correct? So in, inherent existence would refer to something that exists not based on causes and conditions. Yeah. So uncompounded phenomena like space or... Uh -huh. uh, what is the other example of... I know space uh -huh. is one example of uncompounded yeah. phenomena. What are the other ones? But it's not the same. It's not equivalent to permanence, correct? That's my understanding from Dr. Lauren. <laughs> it's not equivalent to something being permanent? It's not equivalent. So uncompounded phenomena is not equivalent to permanence. To a permanent phenomena? Yeah, because even Buddha is not permanent. Mm -hmm. The state of Buddhahood? Sounds pretty permanent, unceasing, right? Uncreated. Well, maybe, but not permanent in the way we use it. In the ordinary. As inherently existent. Existence. Because oh, if you I look see. at the definition of uncompounded yeah. phenomena, it doesn't say permanent. Um, is my understanding. I, I, maybe there's just right. not an English word for it. That's why they call it uncompounded phenomena. That I don't know. I don't know if it's a translation issue. Uncompounded phenomena are permanent. So you're saying uncompounded phenomena are permanent in a different way from than than the way we from what we say as Buddha. yeah as inherent existence yeah because when we achieve Buddhahood it was because of causes and con my understanding is because of causes and conditions that we achieved it. Whereas inherently existent means it's not, it's independent of anything, which does not, which is wrong you, which uh -huh. is what we're trying to get rid Eliminate. of. Eliminate. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So they don't use that. My understanding, again, just my recalling Dr. Lawrence's uh, explanation in the lamb rim. Uh -huh. They never use, they, the terminology the permanent yeah. yeah the permanent word in the way we use it as inherently existent is not equivalent mm. to uncompounded phenomena that's just my understanding that sounds about right 
I could go back and double check it, but yeah. Yeah, no, it's complicated. That's a good point. I That's just good, thought yeah. I'd share that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Good, good, good. Excellent. <clears throat> uh, anything else? Anything else? Hang on, I'm trying to find this other prayer. I want to do this other prayer. Oh, here it is. Okay. Uh, hang on one second. What's the mouse? Here we go. Let's try to do another one last screen share. Okay. Share. So we're talking about aspiration and uh, <clears throat> what better way to talk, think about aspiration than to read Maitreya's aspiration prayer. <clears throat> so this is the noble Maitreya's king of aspirations. Can you all see this? Hope so. Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, Homage to all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Ananda, in the past, when the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitreya was engaged in the Bodhisattva practices, he would drape his upper robes over one shoulder, bend his right knee to the ground, and join his palms together three times a day and three times at night. He would then concentrate on all the Buddhas and make the following aspiration. Homage to all Buddhas. Homage to the Bodhisattvas who possess the divine vision of seers. And homage to the hearers as well. Homage to Bodhicitta, the heart of awakening that keeps the lower realms at bay, that shows us the way to the higher realms and leads us to a state beyond aging and death. I go before the awakened ones to confess any and all misdeeds that I may have committed while under the sway of mind. May all merit accrued through the three kinds of actions become a seed for my omniscience and inexhaustible awakening. The Buddhas are aware and rejoice in any offering made to the awakened ones throughout the Buddha fields of the ten directions, and so do I too rejoice. I hereby confess all negative actions I hereby rejoice in everything meritorious. I hereby pay homage to all Buddhas. May I attain the supreme wisdom state. I exhort each and every bodhisattva dwelling in the ten directions and upon the ten bodhisattva levels to awaken now to supreme enlightenment. And as they awaken to sublime enlightenment, may they turn the wheel of Dharma so as to tame the demons and all their hordes and bring benefit to every living being. May the beat of the great drum of Dharma free beings from their suffering. For unimaginable billions of eons, may the awakened ones teach Dharma and remain. I beg you, best of humans, look upon us drowning in the mud of desires bound by the ropes of craving, and in other ways, absolutely trapped. May the Buddhas not level criticism against those of impure minds. Instead, may they give love to beings and free them from the ocean of existence. May I train in the likeness of the perfectly awakened Buddhas of the present, past, and future, and uphold the Bodhisattva conduct. May I bring to completion the six perfections and lead to the end the six classes of beings. May I manifest at last the six super knowledges and reach the unsurpassed state of awakening. May I realize the truth of emptiness in which all is birthless and non-arising, without intrinsic nature, without location, with neither mental process nor substance. Just like the great sage, the Buddha himself, may I realize the truth of selflessness in which beings do not exist, nor any living things, nor an individual, nor any kind of person. 
May I practice generosity free from stinginess without entertaining any notion of substantiality, nor any belief in the self, nor egotistical clinging, so that the benefit may reach all beings. Since material things do not exist concretely, may all my needs be spontaneously met. Since all material things are subject to decay, may I master the perfection of generosity. With discipline completely flawless, discipline that is per perfectly pure, and discipline devoid of arrogance, may I master the perfection of discipline. With absence of anger, in other words, with patience, akin to how the earth, water, and fire elements, and the wind element as well, dwell not anywhere, may I complete the perfection of patience. With persistent application of diligence, may I ever be joyful and free from laziness, and with strength in both body and mind, may I complete the perfection of diligence. With illusion-like meditative concentration and bravery-inspiring meditative, meditative concentration and vajra-like meditative concentration, may I master the perfection of meditation. Acting with the three gates of liberation, with the equality of the three times and the threefold knowledge, may I master the perfection of wisdom. May I be praised by all Buddhas as I beam with light and splendor, and with the diligence of a bodhisattva, may all my aims be accomplished. As I engage in this very conduct, may I, the one known as Maitreya, bring to completion the six perfections and reach the ten bodhisattva levels. At the very moment I pass away, may I joyfully take rebirth in Tushita heaven and swiftly delighting the Lord Maitreya receive his prophecy of my awakening. <clears throat> so we like to uh, dedicate the uh, merit that we've accumulated in our session today, and in particular um, from this Maitreya's aspiration prayer to uh, our friend uh, John uh, Ruan, who um, passed away on October 22nd. And um, hope that he... Uh, Attains a precious human rebirth and is uh, free from suffering. Uh, so um, Gloria is going to um, make an announcement um, through the email that uh, we will be uh, doing the <clears throat> long the medicine Buddha sadhana, the, the longer medicine Buddha sadhana, um, right after the. Um, Long Life Prayers on Saturday, um, so probably starting around noon or so. Um, so that'll be uh, in person as well as online. Um, so thank you very much for um, coming. And uh, if you have any questions or if I didn't answer your question clearly, please feel free to uh, send me an email and um, I'll get back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anima. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.